Welcome to Fading Memories, a supportive podcast for those of us caring for a loved one with memory loss. I am excited to bring you today Gary Ackerman. He is with eFamily Care, and that is a telehealth company. And I'm going to let him explain the difference between telehealth and telemedicine because that's his thing. Thanks for joining me, Gary. Awesome, Jennifer. Thank you so much for having us. Really excited about uh, the opportunity to have a chat with you today um, and really appreciative of uh, Fading Memories podcast. I actually took the opportunity in the last couple of days to listen uh, to some of the podcasts now that I know about the brand. And, you know, you guys talk about some really interesting topics that are really beneficial to family caregivers that are taking care of their aging loved ones or uh, friends or family, uh, if you will, that are suffering from obviously this awful uh, chronic condition. Um, but there are things that we can do to make life a little bit easier for a family caregiver. Um, and that's what I'm here. Hopefully uh, we could talk about that today. And, and you brought up a really interesting point and, and with COVID-19 and the spread of the pandemic, obviously there has been a huge uptick in telemedicine and telehealth um, interest, not only from CMS, uh, but from family caregivers and all different types of uh, industries, even outside of, uh, of healthcare, you see people using video conferencing and different types of telecommunication capabilities uh, to be able to deal with the current isolation issues that are being caused by this pandemic. Telemedicine and telehealth probably at the top of that list. And the difference between the two, because there is one, is that telemedicine is, it, it should be thought of more along the lines of uh, treatment from a care provider to a patient. That's telemedicine uh, via video primarily, but it could, be, um, it could be via messaging and other types of telecommunications, if you will, that are happening over technology between a patient and a provider. Telehealth, on the other hand, is the same technology capabilities as telemedicine. However, it's not patient provider. It may be um, therapist, and um, you know somebody needing therapy. It may be a solution like eFamily Care provides where we have social workers uh, that are employees of ours that work directly with family caregivers and help them uh, deal with the challenges of dealing with an aging loved one with multiple chronic conditions. And uh, you know, there's a lot of basically anything that you can think of where somebody is providing information, support, resources, education to a user that needs to consume that content in the healthcare industry, you could think of an overarching uh, name called telehealth. But when you really get down to the, uh, the diagnosing and the treating and the prescribing, that would, that's what would be called telemedicine. So that's a good definition of what the difference is. Because I, was, I wasn't clear on that when we spoke earlier. I, I was after we talked, but it's definitely a good idea to to differentiate. So tell me how, how you came to, go ahead. Yeah, sorry, just to dovetail on that thought. One thing specifically that I think is, is worth talking about in the cognitive decline community as it relates to telemedicine or telehealth. And one of the reasons why we endeavored on this journey of building eFamily Care was that a huge part of the aging population um, has uh, some level of cognitive decline, whether it be early onset cognitive decline, it starts primarily at the age of 50, but it gets worse as we grow older. And, um, you know, it manifests itself into a disease at some point for some. And when 95% of the services that are being provided uh, from a technology perspective over telemedicine between a patient and provider, a lot of times they lose their value because the patient doesn't have the ability to really leverage the technology that's there to help them unless they have a family caregiver helping them. So it's something that, uh, may, that not everyone outside of the cognitive decline community actually realizes that it's great that we have all of this amazing technology that pulls together a patient and a provider, but if the patient doesn't have the faculties to be able to consume the content or the uh, information that's being prescribed to them via that medium, it loses its value right out of the start. So that's why we built this telehealth platform that allows us to do the same thing uh, for a family caregiver who can 
execute on that plan that the provider is talking about. Does that make sense? Yeah, and it's really helpful is as I said, when we talked prior to this, I was looking for a service that allowed me to not have to drag my mom to the doctor or, you know, because that system doesn't work for people in advanced Alzheimer's. And unfortunately, <laughs> she passed away right as this pandemic hit. And it wasn't, it wasn't long after she passed away that her doctor messaged me and said that he was doing um, telemedicine at this point. I'm like, oh, <laughs> your timing is, the t is terrible, buddy. So explain to me exactly, well, and the listeners, because I understand it from our previous conversation, Mm -hmm. Explain to me exactly how you guys work. You're kind of the middleman, for lack of a better term, between the patients and their care provider and the the medical system, correct? Primarily, yeah, that's a, that's a decent way to think about it. Um, you know, just d diving a little bit further there, you could think of us, as we said, as a telehealth platform. And our platform is this you know, it's in the cloud, if you will, in the internet cloud that everybody talks about all the time. So our, our platform sits in the cloud and it really sits between a family caregiver, okay, who's the user of our services, okay, somebody who's taking care of an aging loved one, either at home or they're the primary caregiver and responsible for them and they might be in a facility or they might live down the road or they might live across the country. But you still may be the primary caregiver for that aging loved one in all of those examples, right? So the technology sits between that person who's that, that primary family caregiver and our employees, okay? Our employees are, are social workers that are very, we call them care advisors. Uh, they're experienced in, in, in geriatric care management. They have strong written and verbal communication skills because they need to be able to message uh, back and forth via the platform to the family caregivers and do virtual video conferencing with the family caregivers, right? Um, now, the, cust the customers, if you will, uh, remember the family caregiver is the user. The customers are um, large medical, uh, I'm sorry, Medicare Advantage companies, okay? Um, and home health care companies, home care companies, and large hospital systems. So in a large hospital system uh, situation, the hospital system may use e-family care um, to help the family caregivers of their patients recover better at home, reduce hospital admissions, improve outcomes through the help of our social workers. Because the hospital really can't be there 24-7 and return calls and messages quickly to a family member when they have questions. However, we can. So we step in there for the, um, for the hospital systems and the Medicare Advantage companies and being that liaison for them to provide you know, care management, coordination, support, advocacy, resources to that family caregiver. And we do, our, our platform is available 24 seven. Um, so that's kind, of, that's kind of how our product fits into the market. Uh, you have a family caregiver, you have the platform, you have our social workers, but then we sell it to, uh, to hospital systems and then Medicare Advantage companies. And on the Medicare Advantage company side, their primary, you know, their social workers and care coordinators are primarily working on coordinating services for the member of their plan, right? And that has to be their number one priority because the better they can do at coordinating those services, uh, the better outcomes are going to come for the patient. However, we work with them, we work with the members family member, right? So if it's a Medicare Advantage company, it's the member's family member who's the caregiver and we'll work with them. They are our number one priority. So by partnering with a company like ours, a Medicare Advantage company can really focus on the coordination and the services that they need from a clinical perspective, while we can make the family member our number one priority and work with them on the tools, resources, uh, support, and advocacy to make them a better caregiver, how to deal with the uh, ADLs and IADLs that they need to step in and do on the beha on behalf of their aging loved one who's declining um, from chronic conditions. So I have a case scenario for you that maybe you can explain how you guys would work with this situation. A friend of mine's dad had not he'd not had any he very had very little food and no liquids for 24 hours. So he wasn't urinating. He hadn't urinated for 24 hours, which obviously is not good. And she called, what was it? She said the, the advice nurse 
And this is, of course, in the middle of this pandemic, and <laughs> they never got back to her. And so she was kind of left scrambling, trying to figure out what to do. And you know, there was a lot of people she could ask advice of. So, I mean, he's still around, so everything worked out fine. Good. Um, I don't know what health health coverage he has. Um, he's 93 and he's a veteran, so hopefully he's got good coverage. But so if, oh. if yeah, <laughs> he should. <laughs> so he's with a Medicare, obviously ha they have to be with a Medicare Advantage program, right? No, they could be working directly with like a Medicare fee for service type program, or they could be working with a Medicare Advantage program, or they could be on Medicaid. So there's a lot of different uh, but for a veteran, um, you know, I'm not, I'm not exactly sure uh, what that person's particular situation would be, uh, but they may have called the VA hospital or something like that, I would imagine, or just their local hospital uh, or their doctor, you said, and they, they did not get a call back, right? Yeah, it was the advice nurse, which makes me think it was the Kaiser system, but I actually, I'm not sure I've ever heard her tell me which health system they're with, but let's mm -hmm. just say you're working with Kaiser and they would call would they call you and say, hey, dad hasn't had anything to drink in a day and a half and he hasn't urinated in a 24 hours, what should I do? Because with the, with the advanced Alzheimer's, actually he has Lewy body dementia. You know, it's, you can't just say, hey, you need to, you need to drink this glass of water. It's not Some that simple. Some people with that syndrome can't even have a hard time swallowing too, right? That's so. true. Yeah. So um, I know that because uh, I, I know somebody who had suffered from that. However, it's a good question. So it, you know, let's just call it ABC provider, right? So AB, ABC provider gets a call from this primary family caregiver about her dad who hasn't uh, been able to drink fluids and, and she's afraid that he's getting dehydrated and she calls in to the nurse and doesn't get a call back. Um, what, what would she do if she was working with a service like eFamily Care uh, is the question. And this is a great example of the anxiety and stress that gets unduly loaded onto family caregivers based upon the current way our healthcare system is set up. And there's 40 million of these people, just like the example that you gave to me now, out there in the world, basically providing free um caregiving support to their family member. And if you were able to monetize the unpaid family caregivers in the United States, it's a half a, half a trillion dollar a year industry of unpaid family caregivers in the US. So this problem that we're talking about here is, is exacerbated across the country uh, with you know the anxiety that happens when somebody doesn't call you back. But it's not that they don't wanna call her back, they're overloaded and they're in the weeds and they can only provide so much and that's where we come in and supplement that care for that provider where that family member would be able to message via an app on their phone or on the computer uh, via a browser into the platform and say my dad hasn't drank anything in 24 hours i don't know if it's just because uh, he's not thirsty or if there's something more serious going on here i'm concerned what should i do right with and then our care advisor uh would step in and they may talk to our chief clinical officer and get a uh, intervention recommendation from him. Um, but we're not, we don't diagnose or treat, but we give information to the family caregiver so that they can make a better decision on what to do next. And we're going to tell them, uh, you know, steps that they should follow on whether or not, you know, it's an emergent type situation where they should go directly to the emergency room, or if this is something that they could be able to, uh, take care of at home by watching and monitoring certain things. So we have a library of content and resources that we've built up through some of the best minds in the caregiving space uh, over the last several years. And we would, we would deliver them um, not only a personalized message from their care advisor, who they build a one-on-one -on -one relationship with over time and get to know uh, the situation, the case, the family, uh, the patient um, through the family member. Uh, but they also, um, they also would provide some type of uh, curated content to them uh, that would fit whatever problem they were currently having and say, you should keep an eye on these things. If this happens, you should, you should take your father into the, in, in, into the emergency room. Um, the, you know, there's a lot of people in, in the, in, across the world right now that are not going 
to get emergent type care that they need because they're afraid of COVID and they're afraid of the PPE that the hospital has or doesn't have. And if my, I take my aging loved one into the emergency room, am I gonna make them more sick than they already are? Um, and what steps should I take? So if, if they are going to go to the emergency room or our advice is to take them to the emergency room, we're not just gonna say go to the emergency room if your doctor doesn't call you back. We're going to say, now because it's COVID, uh, here are the things that you're gonna to wanna to think about before taking your aging loved one to a nursing home. Do they have the proper PPE? What, are the, what, what, what happened if my parent was admitted to this hospital? How can my parent be discharged from this hospital? Am I, allowed, am I allowed to visit them if they're in the hospital? Do I want to visit them if they're in the hospital? Um, what are my risk factors? So we're gonna give them all of the uh, guidance to put them in a position to ask the right questions so that they don't have to go on the internet and search for hours and hours and hours and then have the anxiety of deciding whether or not they picked the right information that they got from the internet in the first place. We're taking all of that work, all of that stress, all of that frustration, and boiling it down to, they send a message to their care advisor, their care advisor gets that message immediately uh, because they're notified uh, on, you know, via our alert system, and they reply back to that family caregiver with a thoughtful, responsible answer, um, and it, it, it puts the family caregiver in a situation where they have confidence now because they're able to make the right decisions. Uh, so that's how we handle a case from a very macro level. You know, there's a million different examples like the one that you gave, um, but it's all about really putting the family caregiver in a position to make a good decision and one that makes them feel uh, like they are being the right resource and advocate for their aging loved one. Because at the end of the day, that's, that's why they're, that's why they're uh, putting so much time and effort into caring for this person because they love them and they want to make the right decision. Um, a lot of the other things that we're going to work on with them uh, are, um, you know, the, we talked a little bit about the stress and anxiety reduction. That's a huge part of what our care advisors do for family caregivers. They want to know that somebody is there and has their back. That's what we're told by our, our users is it's just nice to know that somebody has my back 24 seven, no matter what comes up, I can reach out and I'm going to get a response. Now, since we partner with the payers and providers, our care advisors actually have the ability to red flag the care provider if we feel like there's something that really is, you know, let's say that we're, we, don't, we don't advise them that they should go to the hospital immediately. We give them some tips, but this is something that we think that the care team should be notified about. We have the care advisor has the capability in the platform to tag or what we call red flag a message and then they red flag that message over to the care team, the care team gets that message immediately. So even though they weren't able to respond to the voicemail because they have so many voicemails that come in all day long, they're able to know if they get a red flag alert from eFamily Care that this is something serious and then that brings it to the top of their uh, attention list and, and now it's on their radar. So maybe they have a higher chance of getting the call back from the provider now because we've been able to ping them and alert them to a red flag situation. Well, I think that would be beneficial for the care providers too, because they're not, they've already, you've already been vetted. Your issue's already been vetted for lack of a better term. You know, it's not, well, my dad hasn't had anything to drink for 24 hours and then they have to go through all of the steps that you've already gone through. So I, I would think it, it sounds like it should be super beneficial on both sides. Well, we think so. That's, that's <laughs> our value proposition, right? Um, but yes, it, 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 it's really beneficial for the care team too, because, you know, especially when after the patient or if a patient is being discharged, knowing that there is a responsible resource to support the family caregiver at all hours um, and be able to get back to them quickly gives them eyes and ears actually into the house um, if, it's, if they're taking care of their aging loved one at home, it gives them eyes and ears into the house and, and they can look at what's going on through the family caregiver, through our technology and keep a beat on this patient even outside of the office. And it's one of the hardest things for uh, care providers to do is what we call close the loop, right? Because once they leave the office or the hospital and they go home, you know, they're not in a, in a, in a clinical professional person's hands anymore. Uh, but they do want to close that loop to make sure that the care plan that they've discharged upon is being carried out properly. And if other issues arise during that uh, plan being carried out, they want to be informed of it. Because at the end of the day, so many providers and uh, 
Medicare Advantage plans um, are capitated now, which is an industry term, meaning that they're rewarded and incentivized based on uh, admissions going down by the patient. So lowering re hospital readmissions. And if they're able to close that loop and monitor what's happening at the home, it's invaluable to them lowering those admissions and improving outcomes long term. I can completely see that. When my, my dad was in the hospital for a month, and when he was discharged after 32 days, he was on a humongous list of pharmaceuticals, like 20 to 25. It was ridiculous. And so we got the list, printed list of discontinue these, change these, add these. My husband, my sister, and I sat there with our heads together, and none of the three of us are stupid. And it was so stressful and so scary because it's like, we're talking about pharma pharmaceuticals. What, what if we screw up? And he was home for a week and then he fell and he was back in the hospital and then he was on hospice. So most of my um, discharge experience, they've been discharged into hospice, which that takes care of a lot of those problems. But I can completely see where, you know, they, they take care of whatever is wrong and they discharge your, your family member with this list of instructions and you go home and go, what the, you know, help me. And so I can totally see how it benefits both sides with having you guys in there. So tell yeah, me, how, well, go well, ahead. Well, yeah, just no, no sorry for, uh, for uh, stopping your next question. I'm just, but it's a great point that you bring up is medication management and efficacy. I mean, this is one of the most stressful things for a family caregiver to be responsible for. I mean, if you mess up, it could be catastrophic, right? So that level of responsibility carries a commensurate level of stress. <laughs> and we're there to help you with that as well. So as part of that discharge plan, uh, you have the ability to upload any type of documents in, into the platform. It also becomes a document storaging capability so that you don't have to run around looking for paperwork all over the place. You have everything stored in one place. And, you're, and, and now your care advisor, right, is able to look at your discharge plan and the medications, and you may even have to mix medications. Um, and, and, you know, who, who knows? You, you know, there's a lot of different medications out there, and there's a lot of instructions, and you have to be very, very stringent. Some of them have, you know, ramp where you, you're giving more overtime or less overtime. If it's, if it's uh, prednisone, let's just say, for example, right? You, you know, you, you ramp up and you ramp down. Well, if that's not paid really close attention to, um, you know, it could turn into issues. And so we're, we'll give you tools and resources that will actually help you manage and monitor that medication distribution properly. We'll give you, uh, you know, tips about different types of products act, out there on the market. Uh, that help you monitor and, and maintain and distribute medication uh, accurately. And what we're looking to do, as we've said, and it's a constant theme here, is lower and, and reduce the stress and the anxiety of the family caregiver. Because if they are in a position of confidence, quality of life improves for both them and the patient, and outcomes ultimately improve as well. Well, just reducing stress is so huge because you know stress is not good for our brains, so we, we don't need that. And I know from experience, when they discharge somebody from the hospital, if you get three minutes of instructions, you're lucky. Yeah. And, con and considering the, the gravity and the seriousness of, of the care, three minutes is nothing. Right. And, and you know, so what we're going to do for, for family caregivers, and, 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 and I'm not trying to sell this, I'm trying to say what family caregivers should have whether it's with the family care or anybody else, right? They should have the ability when they walk into that doctor's office uh, before discharge or they're sitting in the hospital room waiting for discharge, they should be able to message a professional that says, what are all the right questions that I should ask this doctor before he releases my mom into my care? I, I always forget the questions that I should ask. I, 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 they're so important, but then when the doctor comes in, I get flustered and I forget all the questions you have now a piece of technology that you can have in your hand that can make sure that you ask all the right questions um, and then take down the notes that you need to share them with a professional afterwards. And you guys work as a team to make sure you're carrying out that plan effectively at home. Because if you actually, doctors want and care professionals want to be able to answer your questions, 
but they may think they may not know that you have the question in the first place. So they'll take three minutes and tell you what you need to know and assume that you're going to get it. But if you have questions to ask them, they're going to sit there and answer those questions for you. And they'll know that you're a caregiver that actually wants to have a successful outcome and is willing to put the work into it. They'll look at you as part of that team as well, because if the care, the family caregiver is not part of the care team and thought about as part of the care team, uh, you know, it's the most important resource in the care team, especially if the patient is living at home. So we want to put you in a position to really have the attention of the clinical professional you're talking to, be able to ask them the right questions and then be able to follow up appropriately. Nope. That would be very helpful. I, w I wish we'd, I'd had you guys two, three, four years ago, but yeah. Oh, well, we hear that a lot. It's unfortunate. Uh, we do hear that a lot. And the problem, you know, tough problems, uh, you know, end up becoming thoughtful solutions. You know, and that's what we that's one of our taglines, a difficult problem, a thoughtful solution. And, you know, these problems arise and then it, it, it creates opportunities for, you know, entrepreneurs and technologists and clinical people who think of an idea to really fill a gap and a niche. And, and, and that's what we're trying to do out there. Well, that you just teed up my next question. I was going to ask, you know, what was the inspiration or the genesis of eFamily Care? Almost said health again. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, it's, it's a great question. Thank you for that question. Um, because I'm so passionate about this business is why I love that question. Uh, I was a family caregiver for my father before he passed away, and I know what it takes to be a family caregiver. I know the reward that you feel from doing that work, and I also know the challenge and the difficulty that comes along with it. And so I uh, have been an entrepreneur for the last 14 years. Uh, after spending kind of my first 10 years out of college, uh, you know, going out there and, and, and earning my stripes, I took a shot and, and became an entrepreneur. And, and so I really love building technology solutions uh, that provide really exceptional customer experience um, and deliver value. And I was looking to deliver value to, to the customer. In, in, in this case, the customer are payer providers and the user is the family caregiver. But I'm passionate about it because there wasn't anything like it that existed out there. And I was looking to do something in the healthcare space. Um, I had recently uh, you know, left uh, my last career and was looking to, to, to decide what I was going to do next. I knew I wanted to be in the healthcare space. I knew I wanted it to be in the family caregiving space in some way, shape or form because of the experience I had when I was a family caregiver, but I didn't have a strong healthcare background other than the experiences I had on my own navigating the healthcare system to where I agree with you. If this was around 10 years ago when I needed it, it would have taken a lot of stress off of my plate. We do a lot of helping family caregivers figure out the healthcare system and it's not an easy, uh, you know, it's not an easy puzzle to figure out because the puzzle always changes. That's mm -hmm. the biggest reason why. It's never the same. It changes every single year, every single month. Um, but I was lucky enough to partner up and meet, um, you know, an, an unbelievable team of people that were looking to transform the home care customer experience, but didn't have the technical or digital marketing chops. They had the clinical and the home care chops. And so we were lucky enough to get introduced um, and, and the chairman, uh, the, one of the co-chairmen of my company is a guy named Dr. Eric Rackow. And Dr. Rackow is the former uh, chief medical officer for NYU Hospital. And after he left NYU Hospital, he uh, became the CEO of a company called Senior Bridge. Senior Bridge had a home, was a home care company uh, nationally across the U.S. had thousands of home care professionals that were working uh, in the house, in the home for seniors with multiple chronic conditions, and um, they ended up selling that company to Humana, uh, a big Medicare Advantage company, and ultimately it became known as Humana at Home. It was the division of Humana called Humana at Home. He became the president of that division, and the chief professional officer of Humana at Home was a woman named Claudia Fine, who has 30 years of social work um, experience, um, owned her own home care company as well, uh, and then you know joined Senior Bridge, went to Humana. And so I got not only the clinical um, 
side of the, you know, we think of it almost as a three prong stool where I'm handling, you know, the customer experience, the, the marketing, building the technology and the product. And I've learned a ton about the healthcare experience in the last uh, healthcare industry in the last two years. Claudia really oversees our social workers and thinks about our processes, procedures, and quality assurance. And then Eric provides the clinical purview for us uh, to make sure that we're thinking about the underlying chronic conditions and diseases properly. And so we're synergizing those three stool uh, legs of the stool into e-family care. And then our other co-founder um, is a guy named Larry Sosnow, who was one of the uh, founders and vice chairman of Athena Health, which is one of the largest medical record, uh, electronic medical record uh, companies in the country. So the four of us kind of had this vision. We were introduced and we started strategizing and brainstorming this concept at the end of 2018. Uh, we did a beta test with a small version of, our te of a technology in uh, the beginning of 2019, took the learnings from that. We will worked with 25 family caregivers um, and we took the learnings from that to build out the full version of our technology, which we launched in Q4 of last year. And uh, we've been growing ever since. And uh, I'm, I love it because I'm passionate about it. I want to help family caregivers succeed. I want to put them in a position where they feel confident and not insecure. Um, I want to be able to help them have quality of life. So when they're taking care of their aging loved one, they, they can also take care of their kids and they can also take care of their job. It's so much to juggle out there and people don't really understand it until they're thrown into it for the first time. And then the stress just hits the fan and we're there to help them prioritize. Think about the 15 things they have going on. What's going to move the needle the biggest in the beginning so that they can really make some traction. And then we work with them on what we call the caregiver plan over months and months, putting them in a position to become better and better to the point where they can ultimately be a professional care uh, giver if they wanted to, um, but that we put them in, 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 in a winning position. And that's what, what it's all about for us is the family caregiver. Our entire universe is centered around them. Um, and that's why the payers and providers are interested because their entire world is centered around the patient and they need somebody to really support the family because they know how important it is. Yeah, I can tell you from experience that the my mom's doctor was not good at supporting the family caregiver, namely me. <laughs> and she wasn't good at helping him take care of her. So it was just taking my mom to the doctor was stressful, frustrating, not usually very successful in, in solving whatever issue we had. And she did not need a lot of medical care slash intervention until the last 10 months of her life. So we went from like annual visits to almost monthly overnight. And that was like, er. <laughs> and I learned from guests and like my support group facilitator. So when mom was in the hospital and I was trying to figure out what to do, I'm texting all of them. And it would have been nice to be able to work with you guys. Yeah, and, and it's interesting, you know, we take a look at this concept that's been in the medical, uh, in, in the clinical side of things for payers and providers for a long time, and it was called the triple aim. And the triple aim said, you need to have, um, you need to have better outcomes, you need to reduce uh, admissions, and you need to have a strong patient experience, right? <laughs> Those are the three things that they were aiming for. They made it a quadruple aim a couple years ago, and added in that they needed to have a great um, care provider experience, not, not, not a caregiver, but the care provider, right? So that became the quadruple aim. You have a good patient experience, a good provider experience, lower the costs and improve the outcomes, right? You lower the cost by reducing emissions. Well, we're saying that you need to have, if you don't, or we're actually saying, if you don't think about the quintuple aim, you're missing the mark. You need to lower admissions, improve outcomes, have a great patient experience, have a great clinical experience, but the family caregiver needs to be part of that quintuple aim. And if you're not putting the family caregiver into that continuum, you're not thinking about it properly. And so, that, you know, some, some clinicians are, are, are leaders um, as it relates to bringing the family members in, like Dr. Rakow, right? Uh, he, he ran an ICU. He knows how important the family is when you discharge somebody. Um, but, you know, and then there's others that would be laggards, but I think, you know, even the long tail 
of uh, physicians out there that were slow on the uptick are now starting to really see the full value that the family and the home brings into our care world. And if they don't see it from an intrinsic perspective, they see it from a cost perspective because the number one driver of cost for a lot of these large hospital systems is the real estate itself. So you'll see more and more in initiatives endeavoring to move care to the home to lower the cost of care because the real estate is so high for these facilities. So now they're starting to have to come on board with the family because they want to be, get people home, uh, not only for a cost perspective, but think about the, the ability to recover comfortably uh, in your home. Think about the, uh, the mitigation to other germs that are in facilities when you're in your home. And think about the comfort for the, uh, for the aging loved one and you know, being able to relax in your own environment with people that you love, as opposed to being in a facility that can, you know, ultimately, you know, get you sick. And now on top of it, not, I'm not talking badly about care facilities because some people need them, right? You can't take care of everybody at home, right? right? It's not possible. But now, you know, when you think about these uh, memory care uh, communities or aging uh, assisted living facilities or even nursing homes, if I'm, an, if I'm a family caregiver, I can't even go see my aging loved one. I mean, that is very hard and that's hurtful and they're only doing it for the patient's protection, but we're starting to see a trend where a lot of families now are starting to bring their family members back home for the reasons that I just alluded to. They're afraid of them getting sick with COVID and they wanna be able to spend time with them you know, in, in their golden years. So uh, it's interesting to see how the importance of the home is really starting to transcend across the industry. I think people are realizing that the, the lifestyle benefits of not being spread out and not commuting out. I'm in the suburbs of the San Francisco Bay area. So it's nice to hear things like Twitter is going to let people work from home. And the CEO of Twitter is also the CEO of Square, which is a credit card processing for small businesses. And that's the kind of changes I'm hoping to see in the corporate world is it benefits it benefits my employee to be at home they're still getting the work done that they need to get done they're less stressed they're spending more time with the kids so they're not distracted or maybe they're you know they're able to deal with mom a little bit better and then they can reduce their real estate expenses too because twitter's got a pretty big footprint in san francisco and i don't think the rent over there is cheap so i'm hoping that this pandemic has been horrible. Maybe not for you, because um, you probably oh, feel okay. like you've been shot out of a can in the last couple of months. <laughs> from, from a business perspective, it's great. Uh, but I've got three teenage daughters. So oh. uh, one, one is a tween and the other two are teens. And so, you know, they're on lockdown right now, uh, just like the rest of the world. And, you know, we're doing what we need to do to keep everybody healthy and safe. And I, I think that it's interesting to see uh, CEOs of, of marquee brand type companies, especially innovative ones, like the ones you mentioned, starting to make dis decisions about its distributed workforce um, in a situation like this. And a lot of them may even carry that beyond uh, COVID. We happen to be a virtual and distributed workforce anyway. So all of our care advisors work from uh, the comfort of their home. They have their uh, laptops and they're able to do what they need to do to provide the care to the uh, caregivers. Um, but interesting that you bring up employers because um, one thing that we are seeing, in, and, and we didn't envision this when we, uh, when we first launched the company, is a lot of our customers now, the, the, the insurance companies and Medicare Advantage companies and home care companies and large hospital systems, are asking us if, we, if they can use our service as uh, an EAP, an employee assistance program. So a fringe benefit that they would offer to their employees who are taking care of aging loved ones at home. Because when an employee is dealing with a sick family member, tardiness goes up, absenteeism goes up, anxiety and stress goes up, and what goes down? Productivity. Mm -hmm. So because of all those things. So we want, they're starting to look at us as, as an employee assistance program to say, look, we should offer this just like we offer, you know, drug and rehab type services and psychiatric or therapy type services to our employees. Let's offer them this service um, so that we can help reduce their stress, reduce their anxiety, get them the, the help that they need without spending hours researching it, which ultimately might make them a more loyal employee, but also a more productive one. Definitely. So how can people like me, family caregivers, 
put pressure on our healthcare system, where whoever we're with, to say, we want this, get it now? Great question. Uh, I would love an army of family caregivers, uh, you know, creating the buzz out there for, you know, companies like eFamily Care. Look, there's, you know, there's other companies that support family caregivers out there. A lot of them do it differently. Uh, we have our own secret sauce, if you will. Uh, but I would encourage family caregivers to ask their payers and their providers, what is your plan for supporting me? I'm a family caregiver, and I know that if I'm in a position to succeed and I have the tools and resources that I need to be able to take better care of my loved one at home, I'm going to be able to improve outcomes and reduce hospital admissions for my, for my father, for my uncle, for my spouse. Um, what resources do you have for me? And, and, and all the payers and providers have resources. Um, but then, you know, do you have any, anybody dedicated that I can work with as the family caregiver? I'm not the patient, but I'm important. I'm the family caregiver. Do you have somebody that I can call when I have questions that can return the, the, uh, that my call or my email timely because I need information. Time is of the essence. And it'll, the longer it takes me to get an answer, the more my anxiety and stress level go up. And I'm looking to be able to help you. I'm asking you if I can help improve the outcome and, and, and reduce admissions for my loved one. But ultimately, you should appreciate that as well as a payer and provider. And if they don't have a good answer for you, then I would ask them, you know, what their plans are, at least if they're not, if they don't have a system uh, where social workers and care advisors can get back in touch with their family caregivers uh, on demand, I would ask them what the, where it is on the roadmap. Because if they're not doing it today, they should be thinking about doing it really soon. Yeah, definitely. Especially considering, you know, at this point, they don't want you coming in the office or going in the emergency room unless you absolutely have to. So, yeah, that, this, if this doesn't put it on their radar, it's definitely time for a different doctor. And I think there's many doctors out there, they didn't go to med school for all this, you know, management and care teams and all this. They just wanted to help people. Yep. And I'm not sure, and you know, I, this is a whole other semester of school, it sounds like to me. It's well, been a few years know, since or, I've been in college. Or, <laughs> or you know, I, I don't know if it's not, you know, it would be good if there was, it's always good if there's great bedside manner, right? But at the end of the day, you wanna make sure your physician can save the life of, the, of your aging loved one, even if they're not the nicest person in the world, right? Uh, but it's, it's, a, it's about a resurgence in social work, right? I think as we look at our country and where we are relative to where social work was in the 80s, 90s, 2000s, you know, and then we look at it over the last decade, it, I don't know if it was thought of as important as it has been over the last several years now uh, the last three or four years, and it's gaining a lot of momentum. And so it's not necessarily so important that the doctor be able to be a social worker, but that the provider and the payer um, think about how they're going to provide social work um, in a timely manner to family caregivers, because they're already providing it for patients. They do a really, really good job providing it for the patient. But like we talked about, especially with Fading Memories is a great platform for those out there taking care of uh, loved ones with Alzheimer's. That patient can't take advantage of the social work that's being done for them um, directly and they need a family caregiver to step in. And that family caregiver needs a lot of time and a lot of support in order to be able to be successful in caregiving and they need a dedicated resource. I agree. I, I, like I said, wish I'd had you guys many years ago. And even with, when my dad was still around, he's been gone a little over three years. I think he would have benefited because he had chronic illnesses. He had diabetes and all sorts of other related issues and, mm -hmm. and taking care of my mother just exasperated his own issues. And it just, it was sort of like a snowball that didn't, wasn't, it wasn't a good situation. And well. No, well, I can tell you, knowing uh, what I've known about you for the short time that I've known you and, and looking at the work that you're doing, I'm sure that they were lucky to have you, number one, and I'm sure they're proud of the continued, um, you know, the continued legs that you're providing to this mission that you've been on um, and really, you know, filling your passion, which is helping people out there, you know, who family caregivers are suffering from loved ones with Alzheimer's. The work that you're doing is great and you know i'm happy to be part of it and i think you should feel really good about the work that you're doing and even though it wasn't back you know companies like ours weren't around back then people like you were 
And so you're continuing to spread that message. And I think it's, it's really important for all of us that care about family caregivers and the importance of caring for people um, in the home, let's say, to spread the message of the plight of family caregivers and how difficult of a job it is and how, how, how much advocacy they need, right? They need, we need more and more people stepping up, talking about family caregivers like you to their pairs and their providers and talking about the importance that comes from it, the anxiety that comes from it. Family caregivers um, are at, at, uh, at 33% more likely to develop their own chronic illness because they're under so much stress that it weakens their immune system. So let's help these family caregivers help our healthcare system at large and, and be, be advocates like you have been, Jennifer, which, which I'm really, really happy to meet your acquaintance. It's been awesome. Well, thank you. Yeah. This has been great. Fading Memories is also available wherever you get your favorite podcasts.